the only water that had zero TDS? RDI, of course. And I'm just realizing I haven't reintroduced myself for a while, so I'm Matthew from my first fish tank. You didn't even go in. I love you. Love you. Let's talk about the nitrogen cycle. Quick disclaimer, I have degrees in theology and religious studies and philosophy, but I don't have any degrees in science. And the nitrogen cycle is the process of converting decomposing matter back into nitrogen gas. Decomposing matter, and that comes in the form of fish poop, fish food, dead algae, whatever it is, turns into ammonia. Ammonia is super toxic to your fish and to your livestock. Nitrifying bacteria will consume the ammonia, turn it into nitrite, which is less dangerous. Different nitrifying bacteria will then take the nitrite, they will convert that into nitrate, and then you have anaerobic bacteria that's usually like in the center of the live rock or in a deep sand bed, and that takes the nitrate and converts it into nitrogen gas, and then the whole cycle starts over again. So how can you tell the nitrogen cycle is complete? Well, you gotta buy like a really simple test kit. And I actually left in the car. Hold on one sec, I'll be right back. <laughs> okay, I got my bag of goodies. I use two different kinds. This is like my preferred one. It's really hard to find now for some reason. I don't know why. I have a cheaper one from API. It's the API Saltwater Master Test Kit. That's the one I would recommend to beginners. It's the least expensive and all you really need here is you need to be able to test for ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate. So how you know when the cycle is complete, and, and the cycle can take up to six weeks if you don't help it along, is the ammonia will spike, it will go down, the nitrite will spike and go down, and once the ammonia and nitrite are back at zero, the cycle is done. There's really like three ways to cycle a fish tank. Okay, the first one is just to put in like some sort of decaying matter. So like a lot of people use fish food or a piece of shrimp and they just leave it in there, right? And then as that will decompose, your tank will cycle. That's gonna take a long time. Another method people use for cycling their fish tank is using fish. You have to buy some sort of really hardy fish like, like clownfish or damselfish. You're gonna use their food and their poop to help, to help cycle the tank. They're gonna have to be in there while the ammonia spikes. So I don't really recommend the fish method just because it really stresses them out. The third method is really to use some sort of biological filtration starter. So here's what I like to use. Let's see, it's gonna focus. Dr. Tim's ammonia chloride. Instead of having all sorts of organic matter break down, you just, you just add ammonia chloride to the tank. And then while you add that, you get the second part of Dr. Tim's fishless cycling method, which is which is one and only nitrifying bacteria. And it only takes a couple weeks. The basic water parameters are gonna be temperature, salinity or specific gravity, phosphate and pH. Coral water parameters, we're pretty much talking calcium, alkalinity and magnesium. Major elements, minor elements, trace elements. Major elements, there are six of them. Their concentration in seawater is greater than 100 parts per million. Just know this, that six elements make up over 99% of the total composition of seawater. Then you got minor elements. There's also six minor elements. These are elements that are found in seawater at concentrations between one and 100 mil, and between one and 100 mil, between one and 100 parts per million. And then you have trace elements. I was, I was researching this for this video and the best answer I really got was trace elements are less than one part per million in seawater. There's 82, but there could be way more or less depending on what you consider to be a trace element. And even though they're found in like really small concentrations, some of these are absolutely essential for life.
One of the biggest mistakes I made when I started out in the hobby was to chase numbers. I remember I had this Red Sea Reefer 170 and it was in this dank apartment, two bedroom for four people, and I would just obsess with pH. I'm like, oh my God, my pH is 7.9. It's absolutely terrible. You know, we have too much carbon dioxide in here. And so I went through like elaborate measures from like Kalkwasser dosing, which we'll talk about later, to running airline tubing outside and, and nothing helped. And at the end of the day, here's what I realized. My pH didn't matter. Yeah, yes, it matters if it's like 7.5 or like 8.5, but as long as it's consistent, that's what matters. So my biggest advice to beginner is don't chase numbers. Okay, so what, what would I consider ideal water parameters? Temperature, 78 degrees, pretty good for most applications. Salinity, uh, 35 parts per million. If we're talking specific gravity, 1.026. Calcium, 400 to 450. Alkalinity, seven to 10. I usually shoot for like around nine. Magnesium, 1300. Ammonia, always zero. Nitrites, zero. Nitrate, I like to keep it around 10 parts per million. If I keep it at zero, it's too low. And a lot of corals and anemones don't seem to do well. What am I missing? I, I think that's it. Test kits. I think I brought some with me in my backpack just to show you guys. Your basic test kit, you just really want it to test for ammonia, nitrite, and nitrate because that's gonna tell you when the cycle's done and when it's safe to put fish in. So after that, you're gonna have to buy a different test kit to test for corals. There's all sorts of different brands. They're all probably fine. I use this one. It's the Red Sea Reef Foundation Pro. This tests for calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. So absolutely essential once you get corals or you add a lot of like snails or other inverts, that you pick up one of these so that you can see how quickly those parameters are decreasing because you're gonna have to add dosing in later. Then you got stuff for testing salt. The most inexpensive way is called a hydrometer. A hydrometer measures the specific gravity. It's not super accurate, but it's super cheap. The next way is using, is using a refractometer. Third way is using some sort of probe. I like this one here. It's the Hanna salinity tester. Hanna makes really good products. They're a little bit more expensive. But this one, you literally just pop it out. Let me show you. You pop it out, you stick it in the water, and it tells you the salt. The only downside is you have to calibrate it probably once a month because I've noticed it does lose its calibration pretty quickly. But the calibration packets only cost a dollar, so what, you're looking at $12 a year for that. Hannah, uh, I apologize for bastardizing all of this. Col color, c c colorometers, colorimeters, col colorimeters, col colorimeters, colorimeters. It's, it's color emitters, em, 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 emitters. I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Color emitters. Co color emitters? <laughs> I don't know. I don't recommend these necessarily for beginners just because they're expensive. They're awesome because you can get way more accurate tests. Because if you're using like the standard API Master or the Red Sea or, or the NIOS or, or, like, or like any of them, you just have to use your best judgment because all you're doing is you're looking at the color of a vial and you're comparing it to a sheet with a bunch of colors on it, right? So it's not gonna be super accurate. What, what these do from Hannah, these read the color for you. Eventually, once you wanna get more accurate or you just have a little extra money to spend, you might as well pick up one of these col colorometers, colorimeters, colorimeters. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce it, it's so frustrating. Controllers. There's really multiple kinds of controllers, but I'm gonna simplify it. So you have a basic temperature controller, and then you have like an advanced controller. When I first started in the hobby, I bought the Neptune Apex, right? I spent $1,000 on it. And don't get me wrong, it's an absolutely fantastic product, but beginners just don't need it. The other type of controller that I use constantly, and I think every beginner should have, is a temperature controller. I've tried many over the years. My favorite is called Bayite. I don't, I don't, I don't bring it with me, but I'll put it right here. Look, right here, right here. Bayite. But I love the Bayite controllers. They have detachable temperature probes. They have a heating and a cooling element, so you can plug in a heater to the heater, and you can program it to turn on when it gets a certain temperature and turn off when it gets a certain temperature. ROW 
RODI filters. What is an RODI filter? Do you need it? What are the stages? How to put one together? First of all, a warning. You should not drink RODI water. It can actually pull minerals and stuff from your body. So don't drink RODI water. So let me explain the stages of an RODI filter. The first stage is gonna be your sediment filter, all right? That's gonna filter out any debris. It's gonna go from the sediment filter to a carbon filter. The carbon filter, heavy metals, colors, things like that, some chlorine, some chloramines. From there, it goes to the reverse osmosis membrane, the RO membrane. So it basically tries to push water through this wrapped up, I don't know if it's plastic, I don't know what it's made out of, but it looks like, like loops and loops of, of plastic, and it tries to push water through there. So basically, only water can get through and no water that contains any sort of contaminants. From the RO membrane, it goes through the DI resin. It can be one canister or two canisters. And then from there, you have clean water. You should have zero TDS water. Some RODI things to consider, TDS meters. Eventually, your sediment filter, your carbon filter, your membrane, and your DI resin is gonna have to be replaced. And a really good way to test to see when you need to do that is by using a TDS meter. So you can just buy a cheap TDS meter, like the one that, that I use. It's both a TDS meter and a thermometer. Or you can buy an inline TDS meter that comes with the RODI filter, like the clean water system I have from Marine Depot. It has two TDS meters. I've placed the first one right after the RO membrane. The second TDS meter goes at the very, very end after the DI resin. Your RODI filter is really only gonna work if you have good water pressure. Let's say something like 50 to 80 PSI. But if you live somewhere that you don't have good water pressure, then I probably need to add a booster pump. Another consideration is gallons per day. Your standard system is gonna be around 90 gallons per day. You could get way less than that if you don't have good water pressure. Finally, I use my RODI filter outside so I don't have to worry about leaking water, but for years I did it inside. So, so what you can do is there are various leak detectors, float valves to, to solenoid valves, which are electronic. If you're worried about it, if you're gonna be leaving your RDI filter on inside your house all day, it's probably a good idea to get a leak detector and something that can automatically turn it off in case there's a problem. Okay, we're gonna move on to how to set up your RODI filter. I'm not gonna go through a huge explanation. Watch this little B-roll clip that's probably showing right now. It can get a little confusing to set up. A lot of them come mostly set up already, and if you did buy the clean water advanced system that I have, it comes with the inline TDS meter, and that can be really confusing. Understand the flow, where it goes in, where it comes out, and then just follow the directions. But basically, you just need to connect the RODI filter to your faucet or um, to the spigot outside, and then you have to have your clean water, the goes into a bucket to collect, and then you have to have your dirty water that goes into a drain. That's pretty much it. If you do have a TDS meter, you're gonna need to make a couple clips in the RO tubing and then just insert the inline TDS meter. It's not too hard, but for a first timer, it can be a little intimidating. Maintenance for your RDI filter, it's actually pretty simple. The biggest piece of maintenance you're gonna be doing is if you get the clean water advanced system like I have, it will come with this little flush valve that will flush out your RO membrane. The only other maintenance that you really have to do on your RODI filter is replace the various elements. Look at the sediment filter. Once it starts turning dark, just replace it. Sediment filters are super cheap. Then you got your DI resin. I would really strongly recommend buying the color changing DI resin because you're gonna know just by looking at it. There's a noise behind me, you kinda scared me. It was a bird. How often are you gonna have to replace it? It really depends on the quality of your tap water source. Do you have a lot of chlorines, a lot of chloramines? Are you using like well water with a really high mineral content? And then how many gallons are you making?
auto top-offs, ATOs, I really kind of lump them in with your RODI units because you're gonna be using RODI water to top off your tank. Why do you need an auto top off? I mean, you don't you don't need an auto top off system. My 120 gallon system evaporates over a gallon a day, right? Any of you who know a little bit of science, the salt doesn't evaporate, just the fresh water evaporates. So eventually the water level will get lower and lower, which means your return pump will probably run dry. And at the same time, the concentration of salt will go up and up. It's not a big deal if you have like a 120 gallon system, but if you have like a 10 or 20 gallon nano tank, you know, that change can really be really stressful for your fish. So you wanna make sure you top it off every day and to have to like lug big containers to top stuff off is a pain. So what I do is I buy ATOs, auto top off units. And, and these come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes from relatively inexpensive, like 50, 60, $70 to quite expensive, $200. The ones I use have a little optical sensor and then maybe a float valve as well. And it senses when the water gets too low, there's a pump that comes with the auto top off system and it just automatically refills your tank with fresh water. Super handy, super easy. Then all you have to do is refill your reservoir every few days. You know, I get two questions all the time. The first is, can I use distilled water? And the answer is pretty much yes, but commercially made distilled water that you usually just get at the grocery store often doesn't have zero TDS. Like I just bought some the other day and I tested it and it was six parts per million TDS, which probably isn't terrible. Another question I get all the time is, can I just use some sort of tap water conditioner? You know, because in the freshwater hobby, it's just super common, right? And when I have better fish, I use this one. If you were to use just like tap water, for example, my tap water is 175 parts per million TDS. That is way too high, but you don't want all of those other minerals. And this does, this does nothing to remove that. So to answer the question, can you use tap water conditioner? The answer is no, I'm sorry. My recommendations for both RODI filters and auto top offs, here's what I would say. If you want on the cheaper end under $200, I would recommend getting the four staged advanced. My recommendations for auto top off units, Marine Depot has actually a ton that are good, just check out the reviews. But personally, I like to recommend things that I've used and I've used two. On the inexpensive end, I like the Reef Breeders EXO, XO ATO, it's like $90. My expensive recommendation is going to be the Tunzi Osmolator. They actually make like a Tunzi Osmolator, sort of like a, like a Nano now, but I like the original. I've had mine for five years plus. It's never failed on me once. It's fantastic. Okay, I've had to wait until this episode to finally add, can you see it? This is the Innovative Marine Nouvelle Encore. I've had to wait this long to add the salt water. How you make salt water, get out a bucket, get out a trash can, food grade, add in your RDI water or your distilled water, get cups of salt in there, using your factometer, measure it until it's 1.026 specific gravity or 35 parts per million salinity. We're also going to make this tank cycle quicker using the Dr. Tim's ammonia chloride and the Dr. Tim's one and only. Follow the instructions if you're gonna follow that method. It will cycle in about two weeks, at least that's been my experience, rather than six weeks. If I had to pick my favorite salts and give you advice on what to buy, just go to Marine Depot, any salt will work. But my personal favorite right now, I know there's gonna be debate, some people will disagree. I like the Coral Pro from Red Sea, and the reason I like it is specifically for beginners because the Coral Pro has, has elevated parameters. It has high alkalinity, high magnesium, and it has high calcium. And what that means is as you start adding inverts, like snails and corals, right? As long as you keep up on your water changes, this will replenish all of those depleted calcium, alkalinity, and magnesium. So you don't really have to worry about two-part dosing. Last part of the video, additives. And I've really broken the additives down into four 
categories. The first part is two-part dosing. This is your calcium, your alkalinity, magnesium as well, but we're gonna stick with calcium and alkalinity. This is dosing if you have a lot of corals, if you have a lot of cleanup crew members, if you're really heavily stocked. Here's some B-roll real quick of the two-part I use. I only use this two-part on my 24-gallon tank because it has so many corals that it really depletes the calcium and alkalinity quickly. I just throw in a cap full of both the A and the B every single day, and that works pretty well. The second category of additives is trace elements. I use this one right here. I put it in probably once a week or so, every time I do a water change. The third category of additives, I would call coral color and nutrition. I do use a Brightwell product, Coral Aminos. I put them in there about once a week. It's supposed to help with the colors. And then the fourth and final category of additives is anything having to do with like biofiltration, whether that's carbon dosing, whether it's using something like, like Microbacter or Dr. Tim's one and only, really things that help beef up the biological filtration. We're done. Next week, episode five, we're gonna do fish, drip acclimation, and quarantine. So until then, happy reefing. We'll see you next episode.